Ice sheets keep records of past and current climate, and they are a key part of the ongoing global warming. Scientists must go up there to answer crucial questions about climate, physics, astronomy, biology, and many other fields. Our team of six from the University of Montana went there in May and June 2022 to better understand the structure of the snow in compaction called fern, to better understand the role of ice sheet in sea level rise. Greenland is a territory of Denmark, mostly in the Arctic Circle. Most of its territory is covered with an ice sheet, up to three kilometers thick. The ice sits on rock that is not always higher than sea level. Getting there is complicated. The only tourist flights come from Denmark or Iceland. Our journey to get on the ice starts months in advance. We must prepare the electronic, organize our trip there, buying food and other supplies, shipping everything to Greenland. Crevasse safety, duffel bags, ski boots, pack boots. Somewhere in there is the GoPro stuff, sleeping bags, coats, clothes, one tent. We then quarantine for a week at home, then another week in New York, allowing us to test our equipment, by the way. So we're having a week of quarantine on our way to Greenland, and obviously we're not doing nothing. It's mainly about working and preparing things, a lot of little tasks, checking equipment again. Um, and we'll be in Greenland in four days. So, while we are in quarantine, we still have to prepare. And one of the things we have to do right now is practice with our GPS. And so we have a location we have to reach and we have to find exactly what's there. And we're talking about um, being precise a few meters close. Uh, because if we're stuck in a white out, which happens here and there in, in Greenland, if you have a uh, very bad weather, well, it's possible that you don't see anything five meters away. So right now I have a destination I have to reach and I have to find it within a few meters and tell exactly what's there. Finally, we board on a military plane for Greenland. We share that flight with other scientific teams. Some scientists in that plane go to Greenland every year. For some, it is the first time. We are all extremely excited to have our first sights of the continent. town of Kangerlussuaq, there is a U.S. Air Force base. They resupply their base and bring scientists when they can. In that town, all the teams split depending on their final destination. We fly to the town of Ilulisat, further north.
Ilulisat is the touristic capital of Greenland. It is close to the famous Jakobshavn Isbrae, the glacier that retreated so far in the early 2000s that some people feared that the whole ice sheet would disappear suddenly. The terminus of this glacier is not moving anymore today, but it is draining a gigantic area, including where we work. An increasing amount of ice is being melted through there, which means that all of the drained area is being drained faster and faster, cracking up the surface. In Ilulisat, we spent several days making final preparations, buying perishable food, for example, and organizing all the equipment that we're actually going to get on the ice. The plane that takes us to the ice comes from Iceland, and this plane requires good weather in Iceland, on the way to Ilulisat, in Ilulisat, and on the ice sheet. And it is frequent that drop in or drop out of the ice are delayed because of bad weather. Luckily, the extra time we had due to bad weather allowed us to sightsee the town, its surrounding hills, and the icebergs that the Jakobsham is by calves. <laughs> Oh, 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 
Finally, the D-Day comes. We load the twin otter, taking us to the ice sheet and take our ride to the ice. To limit the financial and carbon cost of our trip, we live on the ice sheet for two to three weeks, depending on years and weather. The ice sheet is the most harsh and unlivable place possible. It is just flat, windy, and cold. Our camp is set up to be perpendicular to the wind. We take snow to make water upwind and have toilets downwind. Each one of us has a personal tent. But we also have a common space for eating, talking and sometimes working. And now, we're in the Pavan. Um, living room, dining room, sitting room, office, not the bathroom, that's definitely not here. Yeah, I guess they just fired again. So, Aiden, the generator was out of fuel? Yeah, so what we think happened is when Neil first started it, he said, oh, I'm surprised there's... Our tents are actually pretty cozy and can be above freezing temperature during the day. But at night, temperatures dropped all the way down to minus 24 degrees Celsius in absolute temperature. Remember, the wind never stops blowing. For such weather, we need a good sleeping bag, warm clothes, good winter camping habits as well. Toilets are rudimentary, but this year was a big upgrade from previous years. It used to be a simple trench in the snow. Going out to pee at night can be hard, but it can also be extremely rewarding because the views on the eyes that we can get at night are remarkable. Wind blows most of the time, creating spin drifts, leeward of our tents and our equipment. During a storm, we must frequently remove the snow. Our tents are also buried, and a bad job at making a structure can result in a complete burial. And a small hole in our tent means that blowing snow will infiltrate too. The ice sheet is just frozen water, so all we need is a way to melt it so we can drink and cook. 
Why so much effort? Why go in such a harsh environment? What could justify such a trip? What could justify so much money and carbon? Let me explain to you why. Dr. Joel T. Harper from the University of Montana is a glaciologist. He is the principal investigator of our project. And he collaborated for years with Dr. Neil F. Humphrey from the University of Wyoming. They bring undergraduate and graduate students with them for multiple reasons. Drilling requires many people. It provides fieldwork experience. And the data collected can be worked on by many people. Selected students are usually involved in the research of Dr. Harper or Dr. Humphrey. They are also good skiers and used to winter camping. We work in the lower accumulation zone. This is where there is more snowfall than melt. But there is actually significant melt happening in the summer. In August or September, the surface looks like spring snow. During the summer, surface melt infiltrates the snow and reaches the fern further deep. That is super cold. The melt water refreezes and creates ice layer or ice lenses. Once an ice layer is formed, is the following melt infiltrating further down? Or is it just running off on the ice layer? The answer to this question is crucial to quantify the contribution of the ice sheet to sea level rise and to have an idea of the buffer of energy that is represented by the ice sheets currently. To answer this question, we drill boreholes and we make a log of the ice layers and other snow properties. We are trying to reconstruct past melting events from those. Drilling is a long process. We start by hand, and then we add extensions to our drilling head. To drill at 20 meters, you need to add 10 2 meter extensions, one after another, and all have to be carefully joined. Any mistake and we can lose all of our equipment. Weather must not be too cold, so we can work, but it must not be too hot. Otherwise, snow will melt on our equipment at the surface, and as soon as it enters the borehole, it will freeze again, making everything stuck down there. A generator powers the drill, but that drill is also used to carry up and down the whole core and drilling setup. By the way, this is Gus, and he probably has the hardest job out of all of ours. Yeah, my name is Gus, and, uh, and I'm an undergrad at the University of Montana. Um, and uh, now I've been working in um, Joel Harper's lab for uh, about a year. My, my job on the trip um, was sort of the designated note taker while we were drilling cores. The core would be a meter, typ typically a meter long, and it would come out of the, um, the core barrel. And kind of the, the habit that I eventually got into was uh, like sticking, sticking my hand in a big old mitten um, while we were waiting for the cores to come out of the, the barrel. And then um, I'd take it out and take notes while Joel was telling me um, about the cores and then like put my hand right back in my mitten uh, to try and stay warm. Um, yeah, and that, that was definitely kind of a challenge, just, just staying warm. And then another thing with kind of my note-taking job that was um, sort of took, took some getting used to was just working through um, different pens and, and this uh, really hardcore paper that we had for the, the notes. Um, and this paper had kind of like a, a glossy finish on it to, um, to keep it really weather resistant, um, but it, it only worked with a certain kind of pen. So that was one of the things, and, and another thing was even once I, I found a, a good pen that worked really well, um, sometimes the paper um, would just get too much snow on it to write. <laughs> once our borehole is drilled, we place digital temperature chips in the borehole that we then fill back up with fresh snow. The goal is to make a record of the temperature evolution during the next melt events. The following year, we can come back and compare the new ice layers and the record of temperature to analyze 
the heat transfers that occurred. One of the coolest thing about this field work is the way we move on the ice. The most efficient way of having six people and their equipment moving from place to place on the ice turns out to be this way. Bring two snowmobiles, four pairs of skis and one sled. Each snowmobile has one person on it and one snowmobile pulls a sled and one skier. The other snowmobile pulls three skiers. This is a scientific expedition. Obviously, something is gonna go wrong. Imagine drilling and suddenly your whole drilling equipment crashes on the ground. You drilled into a crevasse. Our protocol in case of a crevasse is an emergency extraction from the ice sheet for all of us. But this one is so deep, six meters under the ground, and it's not that big. After some discussion with the safety team in charge of our group, it was decided that we would stay, but with extra precautions, obviously. For example, we were not allowed to move alone and we must wear a harness at all time, ready to be rescued from a crevasse.
we, so we had the six of us, and we also had a big sled full of gear um, that we call the Sigland. We had to move all of that stuff around on the ice. Um, the way that we did that was we had these two um, snowmobiles, but uh, a few kind of hurdles arose, and, and the first one was um, this crevasse that we drilled into, you know, 10 or 20 meters from our cook tent. Um, and then... So, so after that, we kind of we kind of thought, okay, we've got our two snowmobiles. We're going to stick with these two higher sites. Um, but then uh, I think a few days later, one of those snowmobiles broke down, um, and it was just like acting a little funny. And then on the way back from one of those higher sites, um, died. Uh, the, the snowmobile died probably, uh, you know, twenty or thirty meters from from camp, which was pretty lucky. We tried to get it started for a day. Um, Neil, who's like really, really handy and was doing a lot of the mechanical stuff out there, um, was kind of wrenching on it for for a while, um, most of that day and some of the next day, uh, and just taking it on test drives, and it really wasn't running very well. Um, and I think he eventually decided that it would take a um, pretty deep dive into the engine with a bunch of tools that we didn't have to fix it. Um, so then we had one snowmobile. So, so then we kind of, uh, we ended up sticking around camp um, and uh, drilling a few cores, um, near camp. And then we went up to this, uh, this one higher site. Um, and, and the way that we went to the higher site was pretty comical. Um, now, since we only have the one snowmobile, I think we did maybe three trips. Um, what we did was snowmobile towing a couple people up and the, um, sled full of gear. Um, so we brought the people in the gear up, dropped them off, came back to camp, um, more people, drop them off. We did three trips that way um, to try to get all of all of the six of us up and um, all of the gear that we needed. We were making sure that everybody had a, a satellite phone in camp um, and those people that were getting left out at this site um, and that the snowmobile had one uh, in case that snowmobile broke down. Yeah, so that was kind of uh, one of the more exciting parts of the trip, although uh, not, not ideal to, to have those roadblocks when um, when it would have been really nice to just be able to go wherever we wanted and, and drill the cores that we wanted to. Everything you saw so far actually happened in 2022. It turns out that I went again in 2023 and things were pretty different. First of all, it started with an impressive amount of snowfall. We were walking in knee deep powder, which is extremely rare in the Greenland ice sheet. Usually, there is not that much snowfall happening, especially in the spring, and the wind compacts all of that snow, and it's really easy to move because the ground is pretty hard. In our case, we were permanently walking in deep powder, and the snowmobile struggled to move. But more importantly, one day we had to go pretty far down onto the ice. The goal was to do maintenance on a site, collect data, and then go back up. But when we arrived, we realized that we had several missing poles. All of our dump stuff, I don't think it's seven poles, but it's... There's supposed to be seven? Uh, I don't know, there's seven things here. There's a wire there. With no pole, there's a wire though. There's a pole, there's a soldered wire. There's what? Just wire? A wire. Throw off another side. Pole fell over or something, huh? Yeah. Let's see if that. We'll see which one it is. And they were all in the ground under fresh snow from the last night. And they were all pointing in all directions. In addition, we found that the poles have been ripped. And there were claw marks on the data logger. We found evidence that a polar bear came and messed with our stuff. It is important to know that polar bears that far up are extremely rare. Imagine you're alone on the Greenland ice sheet and just a few hours ago, there was a polar bear 28 kilometers away from your camp with only one thing, your smell. In addition, the very next day, a big storm was coming in and it was forecasted to last for a while. The bear and the storm combined actually made us trigger an evacuation plan. Two helicopters were called in emergency to come pick us up and our very, very minimum personal stuff. 
The small helicopters are pretty cool, and for a while we really thought they would not make it. And just a few minutes after they landed, conditions turned really bad. So we were very, very lucky to be picked out. Je vous vois, mes amis, remonter ensemble la pente. Vous souffrez trop du manque d'elle et votre allure est lente. Dans cette grande cérémonie, soyez les bienvenus. J'accueille avec joie les nouveaux et les visages connus. Vos voix s'élèvent et les tristes souvenirs remontent à la surface. Mais dans la tempête, je suis votre phare. Vous n'êtes plus seul maintenant. Et je vous fais la promesse que tant qu'il y aura des cendres, nous nous rassemblerons. La nostalgie est la seule émotion véritable. Scientists go to remarkably harsh places to answer important questions. The problems we faced did not completely stop us from collecting data and increasing our understanding of how the ice sheet behaves. But our work up there is not done. There is more data to collect, more boreholes to drill, more questions to answer. Our team, like many others, will have to go back on the field. We found our way back to the city we came from. My trip continued after the ice sheet. I went back to Europe while emitting as few carbon dioxide as possible. But this is a story for another time.
Thank you.